Great. So, you know, I, uh, many thanks for inviting me. The, the uh, talks today have been really inspiring. Really nice. Um, and I, I'm just going to give a quick personal overview of the stuff that we're doing with the RCSB uh, to help bring uh, results from the archive to uh, educators and students uh, and the general public. And I work as part of this uh, larger team uh, that uh, do all the outreach work uh, at the RCSB right now. So I'll just start with just a tiny bit of history of uh, what this site, PDB 101, is all about. So way back in 2000, um, I started putting together these little molecular stories uh, as part of a project to test a digital authoring tool called Biostar. It was very much like Wikipedia, where you could put images and text and link them together. And so I wrote a few of these little molecular stories as a way to exercise that um, that tool. Uh, and then uh, Helen Berman at the, the PDB picked it up uh, and started presenting these um, these stories every month at the main uh, PDB site, just as a way to try to bring people, uh, to get people interested in the site and uh, launch them off and uh, into further exploration of, uh, of the archive. And so I continued that every month, month after month. And about 10 years later, Helen came to me and said, you know, um, we've built up a big uh, resource here of articles. By that time, 120 articles or so, I covered just about every basic uh, topic in molecular biology, all the major, uh, all the major molecules. And she said, you know, we should build a bigger tool uh, to take advantage of this resource. So uh, we got together the whole um, RCSB crew and did a brainstorming session and had a, a contest to figure out what the name should be and you know everything you'd imagine, uh, and came up with this um, uh, with this portal. It's an education portal that is parallel to the main RCSB uh, site that's uh, targeted directly to students and educators and the and the general public. Uh, which uh, the, the name that that won was this PDB 101. Uh, and to me, the, the major, um, the, the central feature of this is a number of different tools, browsing tools, uh, for getting to the materials on the site. So there are these subject browsers. There's a nice um, uh, search tool that lets you type in subjects. Uh, uh, also tools where you can look at each of the, the features that we have by date or by category, by title. In other words, giving people a bunch of different ways to get uh, to the materials that we have available on the site. Uh, so then uh, more recently in uh, 2014, uh, Stephen Burley had taken over the directorship of the, um, the Protein Data Bank, and he suggested adding an extra layer on top of this where we have a yearly health focus. Uh, so we bring together all the materials that we have to focus very um, uh, focus directly on different topics. And so we're doing drugs in the brain now. We had one on HIV earlier. We're going to move on to cancer in a couple of years, things like that. Uh, uh, bacterial drug resistance was one, uh, I think that was last year. And it, it's just a way to bring together a bunch of uh, other resources that we have to do a deeper dive into one particular subject. So I'll just spend two minutes here to talk about the, the structure that I've used for these many years on the on this uh, molecule of the month column that I do each month. Um, and so my goal with these is to give a very uh, interpretable, easy introduction to a particular topic. Hopefully to get people interested, give them a few suggestions of entries in the archive that they can start their exploration and hopefully empower them then to, to use more of the tools that are available at the PDB for further exploration. And so I kind of use a formula that has worked for me over the years where I pick a, a topic that's something of, uh, that's going to be of, of interest either with a structure function story or with a, um, some relevance to our own lives. Uh, that this was a topic actually that has both of those things, right? So uh, this, uh, Myelin-associated glycoprotein has a really nice structural function story of bridging two different uh, membranes, the, the myelin membrane to the axon membrane. There's one of my paintings here to show 
a larger context of where this sits within the cell. So out here in this painting, these are all the layers of myelin. Down here is the axon, the green guy right here is the axon membrane, and in the middle is a big mitochondria. Uh, and then uh, in this case, there was also a really strong um, health focus uh, that I could jump into looking at um, how uh, autoimmune interaction uh, with different components in the myelin can lead to multiple sclerosis and pulling out structures from the archive that, uh, that demonstrate uh, those interactions between myelin proteins and antibody FABs and uh, MHC. So anyways, this, uh, this formula has worked pretty well uh, over the years. Uh, a combination of just enough text uh, to let people understand the topic without getting too bored, I hope, uh, and a bunch of illustrations to, to bring it to life. Uh, and so uh, this year I'm celebrating 20 years of these columns, uh, which is quite amazing and um, has been a lot of fun. And uh, periodically we've done surveys uh, and, uh, excuse me, analytics and things to see whether we're actually reaching the people that we want uh, and so the most recent survey last year showed that, that we are reaching teachers. Uh, it's being used a lot in classrooms. Uh, they tend to be uh, maybe undergraduate level uh, and maybe 20, 20% high school. Uh, and no surprise, they're, they're mostly uh, people that are teaching biology and biochemistry. And just a few uh, anecdotal things here. I uh, did a, a shout out on my Twitter account asking teachers uh, how they're using this in their classrooms, just so that we could get a, a feeling for that. And a bunch of people um, came back with these kind of answers where they send their students on a scavenger hunt, you know, say, uh, your job is to find DNA, go find us a structure, look, write us a little article about DNA. Um, uh, but a few of the people uh, showed exactly what I was hoping to see, which is, this kind of a thing where they're sending people to the molecule of month first to get an introduction and a portal into the into the the archive and then telling them to go and explore more deeply uh, once they get that little introduction and so i thought that was very encouraging this is exactly what i was hoping to see uh, and so the the pdb 101 uh, also includes all kinds of other materials that are uh, kind of have that same goal of trying to get people interested uh, in the in the archive, but coming at it from a bunch of different angles, hopefully giving people different ways uh, to, to jump into to further exploration. And so these include things like video challenges, uh, videos uh, that do a deeper dive on one particular subject, posters, animations over here uh, behind my, I assume it's still there, behind my uh, goat. Go to uh, menu. Uh, we've been doing these uh, foldable paper models and origami projects that people can do with them in classrooms or at home and stuff like that. Just a lot of projects uh, coming at it from different angles. Uh, and I'll just do a little, uh, a little deeper um, dive on a few of the of, of the major topics that we're doing. Uh, so Shuchi Duta has been working on materials that are specifically targeted at educators and putting together full lessons lesson plans uh, with uh, materials uh, for everything that a, a educator would need to to teach a certain subject. So here's uh, the the table of materials that she's put together for a um, a lesson on diabetes, starting with basic introductions to, you know, what is a protein, what is an enzyme, doesn't quite go all the way back to what is an atom, uh, but uh, carries people one step at a time all the way up to looking at um, how that relates to the structural biology of diabetes and ultimately treatment of diabetes. And so teachers can pick whatever level they want to enter in this hierarchy of, uh, of different educational materials. Um, Maria Voigt has been working each year on a video challenge for high school students. Uh, this is tied to the health focus that we have each year. Um, and generally they're given a very specific, or a, um, a general topic. We're looking at opioid action and the opioid crisis was the last one. 
make us a film that describes the structural biology behind, behind that and maybe ways that that's going to help people uh, make better choices. And so my favorite here was uh, this little cartoon one uh, called Opioid Busters. Great fun. These students, they come up with the best stuff. They're quite amazing. We also do fun little one-off projects like these. Uh, this is a poster we did for the, the Diabetes Health, fo health Focus built around uh, one of my paintings uh, that shows the um, cell here, or the insulin receptor with these little yellow guys or insulin, uh, and then uh, calling out all of the different protein structures that are relevant to the processes that are happening during insulin signaling and going into a, a deeper explanation of those uh, talking about structure function relationships in, uh, in those different topics. Uh, we've also done similar things in interactive uh, presentations where, uh, again, using one of these paintings as the, as the map and then having a clickable version of it that people can go and explore each of the bits and pieces and then look more uh, detailed at the, the structure and the function relationships of those. Uh, what was on this? So down here at the bottom, uh, recently I've been exploring more uh, the possibilities of using art as a way to um, to reach uh, an even larger uh, group of people. Uh, a number of years ago, the uh, RCSP got permission from the Wellcome Trust to make a bunch of Irving Geises, wonderful, wonderful, just. Uh, earth-shaking pictures of uh, the, the first molecular structure, structures, making those available on the site. Um, so that was great. And then a few years ago, we added this uh, gallery of, uh, of my own paintings, uh, both of those uh, available for use uh, for, for any kind of, uh, um, of applications. Uh, this is uh, one of the more recent uh, examples of one so we added to that gallery of mine, uh, this is a painting I did early in the pandemic last uh, February of a cross section through the coronavirus uh, in respiratory uh, mucosa. So these green guys are mucins and antibodies out here in yellow, uh, the spike protein everybody will recognize. Um, you have to be a, a, a little generous with this because it was at the beginning of the pandemic and uh, we didn't know a whole lot about a new coronavirus. So this is much more relevant to the, the SARS before. There's some uh, some big differences in the structure with the uh, with the new one. Uh, and uh, to to make this uh, even more accessible to uh, to people, we did a coloring book version of of that painting. Uh, tossed it out on the site, talked it up on Twitter, and um, got a bunch of really wonderful responses from people all the way from from little kids doing this to uh, people doing very detailed pictures, uh, kind of as a, a meditation, I guess, to uh, to get away from uh, the, the horrors of the pandemic. And uh, so here are a few of the responses that we got from people uh, on Twitter about this uh, as they were were posting their their colored versions of it. And to me, this this was really very inspiring and. and the reason that I do all of this was were these kind of responses from people saying that um, people were were taking these uh, these coloring uh, activities and sitting down with their children and using them as an opportunity to to talk about viruses and uh, how it's something that they don't that, that it can be fought and they, you know it's it's not an invisible an invisible enemy. So this was super encouraging. Uh, and you know so. I'll just finish up with a, a kind of a little fun side project I've been doing over the past couple of months, uh, basically to to rekindle my own love for crystallography. You know, I I do nothing but write and draw pictures these days. I haven't solved a, a crystal structure since graduate school, so I thought you know it's time to reconnect with with crystals and symmetry and all the things we love about that. Uh, so I. Um, decided to draw some pictures of, of some of the biological crystal lattices from the uh, from the archive. And, and so here are a few of the things. I did these as uh, for, an, for an art show I was going to do, which unfortunately, one week before, I actually had mailed all the, the paintings off to the gallery. And then one week before they uh, they had to cancel it all because of the um, the pandemic. Uh, so here's a, here's a ferritin in a beautiful hexagonal lattice. Um, 
my rules for generating these images is that I force myself to use the real uh, crystal symmetries, but I let myself do anything I want with, with colors. Uh, this is a, a phage a portal a protein and a wonderful tetragonal lattice. Uh, beyond belief, uh, this is a nucleosome array. So you can kind of follow the DNA wrapping around and coming over around this one too. And uh, beyond belief, you know, the things you find in crystal structures. The one that started it all, uh, this is the uh, myoglobin structure from, uh, from Kendrew. Uh, the interesting thing about this is that I've been doing fabric uh, prints with these things. And with this kind of a monoclinic lattice, of course, I can't just make a tile this big, right? Because they won't, they won't uh, match up to be an orthorhombic tile. So I actually, when I print this on fabric, I have to give them this big, long tile. That's the whole width of the thing. Uh, and so here we go, something from the um, CCDC. Uh, I uh, recently started doing up a little piece on uh, uh, chloroquine uh, and the me me mechanism of action of it in uh, malaria. So I went and dug up the picture of the hematin, the crystal of, of heme from the, the database. Uh, and finally, this, uh, the, my last slide is the, um, the main protease from uh, uh, from coronavirus, and uh, somebody on Twitter suggested and said, "Gee, you know those look a lot like magic eye pictures." I said, "Yeah, well, you know they do look a lot like magic eye pictures." So this one's a magic eye picture. Um, if you stick your nose right up close to the screen and defocus your eyes and fuse to them, it's a wall-eyed one. Uh, you'll see that the whole picture is in uh, is in 3D with that kind of a, a magic eye thing. And so I've been going kind of crazy with those lately too. So that's what I have for you. Thanks.